Well, thank you, Mike, uh, and thank you, Chris, and the rest of AEWE. My name is Greg Hall, and I am a senior renewable energy policy analyst at the Cadmus Group, right down the street. Uh, colleague of Brad Jones, and today, or tonight, I'll be talking a little bit about Massachusetts Solar uh, specific, specifically the policy landscape, and in as some of you may know, the policy regarding solar is changing this year uh, and into next. Uh, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Before I start, uh, does anybody you raise your hand if you had uh, any experience doing solar commissioning, design, uh, or interconnection for utility? So a few of you? Okay, a good amount. I guess I'm not going to get away with everything. <laughs> but like I said, I'm a, a senior analyst at the Cadmus Group down the street, here with my colleague Chris and Will. Our, our team is the Renewable Energy and Resilience Team. And we do a variety of projects, both on the technical side as well as the policy side. I admit I'm not an engineer, but not all of you guys know solar, so we're, we all have efficiencies here. Uh, but our two presentations are going to run simultaneously, and I think we'll just open up for questions at the end. Uh, a little bit more about Cadmus: we do inspection, submission, uh, design reviews, uh, feasibility studies, uh, as well as uh, work with municipalities navigating solar procurement and uh, Personally, I've worked with the Cadmus Group for just about three years and have navigated just over a dozen municipalities through developing solar on public land, and I help manage the administration of the Net Metering Program here in Massachusetts. So, for those of you who are familiar with uh, solar in Massachusetts, it's grown a lot in the past seven years. Uh, Massachusetts has become uh, somewhat of a leader in the space, and much of that uh, growth has occurred fairly recently between the uh, Paul Patrick and Charlie Baker administrations. Uh, you know, being a proud native of Massachusetts, uh, you know, it's, it's always been a source of pride for me that the, uh, the state has taken such, such an active role in Massachusetts. And one metric uh, that is often cited is Governor Patrick's original goal, 400 megawatts of installed solar by 2017. Uh, Right now, we are in 2017, and we have 1,600 megawatts of solar installed in the, uh, in the state. So the, the state has managed to quadruple the goal uh, originally set, uh, which is no different than our performance in other arenas as well. But that doesn't really make sense, of course, because if you look at this uh, map provided by the National Renewable Energy Lab, uh, that shows sort of a heat map of solar access in, in the United States, you'll see that Massachusetts and Greater New England is lacking in probably the most important, or probably the most important variable uh, concerning solar generation. We don't get a lot of sun in Massachusetts. So, the fact that uh, Massachusetts is widely regarded as the number one market for residential solar in Massachusetts doesn't seem to keep with the facts. Also, if I was a solar panel, this is not what I would want to ever see. And we happen to get this, uh, you know, in some, some certain years, about 30% of the year. We bore each other enough talking about the weather here in Massachusetts, but in truth, it's the solar panels who really suffer. So that's for policy. I like to think of solar policy in Massachusetts as sort of the connected tissue between uh, various players of work that allow this market to thrive. Uh, Massachusetts has a relatively affluent customer base and uh, with, with high property values. Uh, there is a robust investment community operating in the Northeast uh, with plenty of avenues or plenty of other opportunities to invest, yet they still have chosen to invest in solar. And the United States can boast a, uh, an advanced solar PV industry uh, that operates across the nation. It's just the solar incentives, the loan programs, and the policymakers in the state that draw those players together and, and create the, uh, the market we have today. Uh, back in 20, 2008, uh, the Green Communities Act passed, and that uh, created a mandate for utilities to cover a certain portion of their generation uh, with renewable energy. Since at the time, most utilities didn't have renewable or enough renewable energy generation uh, in-house to cover that requirement, it created a market for 
uh, third party developers to develop solar and then sell renewable energy credits to the utilities uh, to cover that mandate. At the time this program was developing, the, the administration sort of set forth a couple of goals that had pretty much governed solar policy in the state uh, since that date. Four goals are here, and they all, they all make general sense, and they, for the most part, hold true for incentives in other industries as well. Uh, but the, the number one goal is to sustain long-term growth. This last seven years has been very successful for Massachusetts in regards to solar, uh, but it doesn't do anybody any good if you have robust development over seven years and then the entire industry goes silent. That's a lot of people who are skilled and, and you know, get trained up in skilled labor and then are out of luck and at work. So sustained long-term growth is, is you know, one of the main priorities of solar policy in the state. Uh, second is to encourage solar development across multiple sectors. I'm sure the utility folks in the uh, room will appreciate the fact that solar uh, out on a green field where there's no load is not nearly as useful as solar on a roof where there is load, or where there's a you know a more diverse uh, map with better in, uh, with better infrastructure in place. That's why policymakers in the state have really taken a keen eye to developing solar policy that allows for diverse projects. Uh, but none of this would be possible, and it was one of the things that was outlined in 2010, uh, was that regardless of where you want projects or the, the state is moving towards a renewable target, there was not sufficient uh, interest from the investment community. And for that reason, they had to put in place some type of uh, incentive structure that would allow the investment community in the United States uh, ample return on investment. And finally, and something that's really grown in the past few years, is uh, sustaining long-term growth for the sake of sustaining the, the demand for skilled labor in the, in the Commonwealth. Um, I'm blanking on the, the metric, but there, but there are tens of thousands of jobs now uh, strictly in the, uh, in the solar industry. And it's, a, it's imperative, or it's a, it's a priority of the state to sustain that demand for that skilled labor. Again, I mentioned that it was ranked as the number one residential solar market, and this solarpowerrocks.com is a consumer website uh, looking strictly at residential solar. And this is their, you know, I thought it was a neat graphic of showing, you know, a, a state report card. And as you'll notice, the rubric doesn't, doesn't include anything about solar access or the natural endowment of Massachusetts. It's strictly policy incentives. Uh, this, these incentives put in place by policymakers are really what drives uh, the interest and the growth uh, in the industry. As you can see, these are some pretty neat metrics. If you put a 5 kW or 5 kilowatt solar uh, array on your home, uh, which is you know a modest sized solar array for any residence, you're going to pay. You could pay back in as, as little as four years for a system that could generate power for 25 to 40, 25 to 30 years. That's quite good. Not to mention the uh, the handsome return on investment that's possible. Uh, I touched on the history a little bit, but this is sort of how would be the various incentives that have uh, shaped the industry to date. Uh, the Federal Investment Tax Credit, which many of you may have heard of, is uh, an investment tax credit that was put in place by the Bush administration, which allows an investor a 30% tax credit on their capital investment in a project. This has really drawn in a lot of the big fish of the industry into renewable energy across the country, uh, but is you know, obviously also available in Massachusetts. And also allows folks to invest in, in solar where there isn't that, where there isn't quite as much sun. Uh, so there's the federal investment tax credit that sort of sets the foundation, but the solar renewable energy certificates, uh, SREX, uh, and virtual net metering are the two, what I would consider, uh, Anchor incentives in the Commonwealth. Uh, SREX from 2010 to 2013, what's known as the SREX 1 program, that was the program put in place to get the state 400 megawatts worth of power. The uh, 400 megawatt goal was set for 2017. They hit that in 2013, so that meant that the program in sunset. So they extended the SREX program in the form of SREX 2, which dialed back the level of incentives. Uh, which brings us to today. And that SR2 program had a goal of 1,600 megawatts, which we surpassed last year in the summer of 2016. Uh, SR1 per context uh, was about 45 to 50 cents per kilowatt hour. It's, you know, 
compared to maybe the 20 cents you're paying per kilowatt hour at your home, that's a very, that's a, that's a, a pretty high level of incentive. To SREC2, they dial that back to somewhere in the, in the 23 to 28 cent range. Again, all of this is funded by ratepayer uh, rate funds. And so it was the, the policymakers' uh, goal to dial back the incentive such that it would still sustain long term growth, but not necessarily burden the taxpayers at the SREC1 level. Virtual net metering, for those, uh, you know, I'm happy to talk about this after, but virtual net metering allows you to generate power on site, export it to the grid, and then sell those credits or, or distribute those credits to accounts not necessarily on site. So it allows for a lot more project flexibility and allows, allows for large ground mount uh, projects away from load to still benefit uh, customers uh, across that load zone. It also is very useful for low and moderate income housing developments as well as uh, community shares. And finally, uh, the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center uh, administered two uh, incentives that sort of form a continuum. Started with a rebate program known as Commonwealth Solar, which helped uh, fund some of the upfront investment necessary in solar. Uh, but since those rebates were often going to project owners and project developers from other states, a lot of that, that ratepayer funded rebate money was going out of state and to the southwest. So more recently, the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center has implemented the solar loan program, which leverages local funding for residential solar in the state and sort of recycles that ratepayer uh, rate funding uh, in the local economy. Just a, sort of a look at uh, the installed solar capacity over time in Massachusetts. One thing I would point out, 2010 to 2013, the capacity more or less doubled year over year. And that coincided with the strong incentives with SREC1. SREC2, the, uh, the installed capacity more or less leveled off. Uh, and 2017 looks on track to more or less match, either match or exceed 2016. So, so far, sustaining long-term growth is to be that goal. Of course, things are changing, though. And uh, one of the reasons for this is that while the incentive programs to date have been very successful in uh, sustaining long-term growth and you know, surpassing well beyond the, the, the goals of the previous administrations and well ahead of schedule, uh, these are ratepayer-funded incentive programs. And, and, if, and if the growth is any indicator, uh, there is an opportunity now to scale back those incentives and still achieve the four goals set out before. Um, as, the image, as the industry matures, PE cost comes down, and it's the current administration and the Department of Energy Resources goal, as well as the, uh, the utilities in the, in the state, to dial back the incentives consistent with, uh, with technology costs. Again, rate, minimize rate payer impact. Not every rate payer is. Uh, has solar on their home, yet every ratepayer in the in the three investor utilities is paying into the programs. You want to avoid a boom bust cycle, so you want to smooth the transition to the next incentive program. Uh, and more recently, there's been really, you know, if you're going to dial back the incentives, you want to ensure some type of pricing uh, pricing certainty. So the next uh, solar. Uh, the next incentive program that is set to kick off in the spring is the Solar Massachusetts Renewable Target, uh, known as SMART. Uh, the program it, it has been developed mostly, uh, in, mostly with the coordination of farm energy resources and the three investor-owned utilities, National Grid, Mill, and Eversource. Um, I'm happy to talk uh, after my presentation about this. It's, it's a fairly complex program, but some of the major keys of the, of the program are, again, uh, limiting price uh, uncertainty. So under the SREC program, you had incentives that were, were fixed to a market or market-based and not necessarily certain over time. This is not what a Wall Street banker wants to see when they uh, invest in the project. They want something more like this. Now, of course, 
this, the area under the curve is reduced in the SMART program, but there is some type of certainty. Uh, the energy here, the blue, is represented by the value of energy, which more or less is equal to the value of the net meter credit. And the SREC program is transitioning into what's just a, a pure incentive, uh, which covers the delta between your energy payment and the total incentive that your uh, project generates. Uh, the incentive value that a project generates is based on a couple different factors. Um, if the DOAR, you know, it, it, again, policymakers want the incentive to be based on the configuration of the project and who it serves. Uh, so they want to prioritize certain types of projects. Project size to load, uh, projects that serve low to moderate income, projects that incorporate batteries. Uh, the SMART program allows them to sort of calibrate the amount of incentive based on uh, the value that uh, project offers to the general public. Now, if, you, you know, if, you want, if you're more curious about that general concept, uh, New York is doing something a little bit different where they're really focusing on the value of solar as it interacts with the grid, but the whole different ballgame in New York is way more complicated, so uh, for the purpose of this uh, presentation, we'll just focus on Massachusetts. But again, this idea that SMART is going to be paying people or compensating people for solar consistent with the cost of uh, affordable pay, uh, you know, that balances rate payer impact uh, with the necessary investor return. But this does cause some complications because when you take something like energy storage systems, the way that, the way that incentive is calculated is through this table. So you take its storage KW versus its storage hours, uh, and that's how you calculate the payment. Again, this is un the underpinning of this is a pretty in-depth uh, industry analysis uh, by a, another solar consultant. But again, if you sit down with somebody and they're down the table trying to sell them uh, an energy storage system and you give them this, you're, you know, uh, customer acquisition costs are probably going to rise. You're not, you're not going to be very successful. So there are definitely challenges and definitely growing pains around the industry. And finally, uh, some things to watch as SMART uh, develops and as it's implemented uh, are one, the program complexities. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty big departure from the SREC meeting of the last seven years. Um, and it's, it's not clear at this moment what the incentive will look like since uh, it will be determined by open solicitation in October. Uh, the rate ceiling is 17 cents per kilowatt hour with then additional adders depending on your project's configuration. Uh, there will then be a Department of Public Utility, uh, Department of Public Utilities rulemaking, which is set to conclude sometime in the spring. Uh, and finally, uh, there is also a, uh, a trade commission petition from Sineva and Solar World uh, to implement a tariff on imported solar modules, which has the potential, based on certain studies of my other consultants, to increase uh, the cost per module. Uh, the, the complication involved there is that if you develop a, an incentive program on historical cost for solar modules, and then a shock in the system sends solar module pricing up 50%, well, the, the underpinning of the solar incentive structure is sort of rendered uh, obsolete by this shock to the system. So it'll be interesting to see how the DOE <coughs> and uh, the solar uh, or the smart program administrator deal with these potential hiccups. But overall, um, you know, it's a clear signal to the solar industry that the, the, the Commonwealth is still serious about growing up or maintaining the solar industry uh, with the obvious caveat that they dial back the incentives consistently. Quick question. Quick question. The sure. 17 cents, what, since the ceiling of 17 cents, or it might, obviously it might be a slightly different number. Sure. And I was looking at your chart in your graph report. Is that the cost of electricity plus the incentive equals 17 cents? Or is that 17, whatever that number can be, on top of whatever you displace and what you're using in your net metering? So the, the 17 cents would, would create a base rate 
And then if you were a residential system, you would get something like 150% of 17 cents to start. And then if you incorporate, so, so say you start at 20 cents based on that uh, rate. And there are plenty of rate tables on DOE or ERS website where you can sort of triangulate how your system would, would fit in. Uh, and then there are what are called adders. So that matrix I showed was just if you have, uh, if you incorporate a battery, you then, based on the battery's configuration, would add four cents on top of that base rate. And then if you start low income, you would get another four cents. So you, you know, through a combination of your base rate. Or is that the total payment that you receive per kilowatt hour that you enjoy? Yes. And then the energy payment, if you were to receive net metering, you would receive the net metering value through net metering. And then you would receive whatever balance there was between the full incentive and net metering as basically an incentive payment. So you would so the less the cost of electricity is seven. No, the seventeen yes. minus yes. minus the cost of generating electricity. But that's costs. only yeah, it, the, well, we can talk about this after, but that's only if you get net metering and certain utilitarians don't even offer net metering at this time. So we would there are a couple other considerations which I'd be happy to talk about. Because I don't want to take any more time.